Welcome to our event tonight. Um, I'm Dr. Agarwal. I work with uh, the Movement Disorder Division and also Center of Neuromodulation in Ohio State. We are putting together a little program tonight, and thank you for all being here. Uh, this is our, our occupational therapist, uh, Ms. Baumgardner, Gardner, our nurse practitioner, uh, Jen Gadowski, and our neurosurgeon, Dr. Krishna, and myself. We're just going to talk about essential tremor in general medications used to treat tremor, and some of the things that we ignore, like lifestyle modifications, and also when medications fail, some of the options in surgery. Um, a lot of people often are scared about these techniques and stuff, but for essential tremor, it is something that offers hope, and uh, education is key here. Um, so without wasting too much time, I'll introduce our first speaker, Jen Gadowski. So as uh, Dr. Agarwal mentioned, I'm Jennifer Godowski. I am the nurse practitioner in neuromodulation neurosurgery, so I really pretty much see you after the surgery, um, a little bit before as well. Um, I tend to find history a little bit exciting, and um, maybe some people find it boring, so this is where you take a nap if you find history boring. Um, basically, he, uh, essential tremor in history, uh, I think it was first sort of um, originated with Ayurveda, which is of the ancient people in the region now known as India. Um, they, it was also kind of more holistic medicine. Um, medical historians have found references of hand tremors within these records, um, as well in Egyptians, with Egyptians in uh, 12,000, I'm sorry, 1200 BC, as well in, as in the Bible. Um, two verses, two different verses in the Bible where um, it was when wisdom and advice is being offered to the young, comments are made of the trembling movements seen in the aged. And in Psalms, there is a reference to observations of fear and trembling movements, which is a little bit more of a stretch, I believe. But I think patients in, uh, with tremor would probably agree that strong emotions and stress can accentuate their tremors um, and their symptoms, actually. Uh, there's also a Greek physician, Galen, um, who wrote a paper uh, it's most notably written is uh, on tremor, palpitation, spasm, and rigor, where he depicts the rhythmic nature of tremor detailing other involuntary movements of the body. And his, his observations are actually still pretty valid today. Um, as well as writers and artists uh, like Shakespeare in um, Troilus, I believe it's Troilus and Cressida, um, where he describes the inability of an aged character who can't fasten his clothing um, because of the tremor, as well as Da Vinci wrote, you will see those who move their trembling parts, such as their heads or hands, without permission of the soul. The soul, with all of its forces, cannot prevent these parts from trembling. So something as far back as Da Vinci, sort of noting this kind of a thing. Uh, Rembrandt also sketches of the elderly shopkeeper in the Good Samaritan, showing a stooped position in the hand tremor of the shopkeeper, obviously indicative more of, of Parkinson's. Sorry, there's just one more slide of this, and I, I promise I'll stop boring everybody. Um, uh, neurologist Charcot it, it, uh, and other physicians assert that once tremors occurs, it persists throughout the remainder of life, that life events and stress might cause or worsen the tremor. Head nodding or shaking are also manifestations of this. Um, Dr. James Parkinson, clearly I think you can make the, uh, and sort of the correlation here too, um, detailing that the now what the condition now known as Parkinson's disease and disting distinguishing Parkinsonian, Parkinsonian tremors from other tremors, including essential tremor. Dr. Charles Dana, as well in 1887, uh, reported a large family um, and, and essential tremor, which is the first actual detailed account of essential tremor. He noted that the various body parts were affected and age of onset varied among family members. He hypothesized that the nervous system was differed in these individuals and called this actual neuropathic taint. So clearly, um, Freud has to get involved with that whole statement and therefore um, said that he made the effort to explain that physical phenomena of the, um, on the basis of the individual psychological makeup associations and associations of that tremor being a sign of nervousness, drunkenness, anxiety, stupidity, intelligence, brilliance, or brain damage, all of these things. Obviously, they're all over the board. Fortunately, none of these assertions have been substantiated by modern medicine or modern investigations. Um, historical treatments undoubtedly included various herbs. In, in 1688, Robert, um, Robert Boyle uh, suggested uh, chocolate as a remedy. So I clearly find that pretty interesting, and I think we should try that again. Um, as well as alcohol, but obviously um, alcohol can 
lend to alcoholism and clearly kind of negative consequences with that. And then, of course, I yeah, I'd accentuate the chalk a little bit more. So just FYI, this is not to be at all insulting in any way, but I think fortunately, because not fortunately, but unfortunately with um, Steven Spielberg telling us, bringing it forward that movie E.T., I think when you say E.T. out in the public, they think, oh, phone home, extraterrestrials. That is not what we mean here by this. So what is E.T. exactly? So it is the most common movement disorder. It's eight times more common than Parkinson's, affecting up to 10 million people in the United States. Um, I think there were 325.7 325, million people in 2017 in the United States. So realistically, you're looking at 3% of the population. Estimates of the prevalence have a wide range of 0.08 to 220 cases per 1,000 persons. That's a 2,750-fold 2, 2, difference, and there has been no formal attempt to sort of synthesize these incongruent results. Um, because of this variability of the number of existing cases of ET, the population is essentially unknown. Uh, this information is actually really important. Um, it's actually uh, going to be that prevalence is one of the central variables that is factored into sample size calculations. Um, the disease won't affect your mortality, your life expectancy, but it does cause considerable functional disability and serious psychological effects. There are no specific anatomical, physiological, biochemical, genetic markers, that sort of thing, as well as PET studies can, um, in ET patients have revealed increased cerebellar activity. Um, the cerebellum is a region in the back of the brain responsible for timing and coordination of movements. ET is largely hereditary, transmitted in an autosomal, autosomal dominant pattern. There is evidence from multiple large families in which ET occurs at, and there is a genetic component, but that the regions on certain chromosomes um, which have been found are only the cause within a few families. So while 50% of people with ET have one or more affected family members, a clear genetic cause is not actually revealed in all cases. So a little bit of background with regards to this. Obviously, like we sort of discussed, it can vary among family members and among patients in general. Um, one family member may develop symptoms in their 50s while their son or daughter may have developed tremors in their teens. However, the incidence and prevalence increases dramatically with advancing age. Um, again, sort of development later in life, at childhood, even infancy has been seen. Tremor can be in the head, neck, voice, upper extremities. Onset of symptoms are insidious. The development actually is so insidious. Um, actually, yeah, the tremor itself can vary in location. Like we said, the, the mom can have it in, in her head and, and voice, and I can have it just in my hands. Males and females are affected equally, but the location of the tremor does show some sex-related uh, preferences with regards to um, more women have it with vocal cords and in the head. Um, the development of ET is so insidious, like I started to say, you can't recall the date. Some people can't recall the actual date of their, uh, when it started, when the actual tremors began. Some people can do it within the year, but this could just be when the individual could recall their first troublesome incidents um, with tremors, not necessarily when the tremor initially started, but this is when it finally reached the level of it um, where it interfered with life, like taking communion, buttoning your shirt, that sort of a thing. And this is kind of what I just said right there. Spontaneous fluctuations can, uh, in the amplitude of tremor, are common over the course of the day. Um, it can worsen with, obviously, stress and anxiety. Maybe there's smoother times as well. Um, <coughs> it is progressive, and patients with ET, um, with advanced ET, have intention tremors, impaired gait suggestive of cerebellar involvement, resulting in loss of independence, physically not being able to dress or feed themselves. And in these late stages, cognitive impairment and personality disturbance can be seen, although it is not common. So the etiology, kind of what's causing this, um, relatively obviously unknown, as I'm saying here. Um, there's hypotheses, but uh, broadly speaking, the important causes of tremors include neurogenitive diseases, stroke, head injuries, drugs, toxins, demyelinating disorders, systemic illnesses, metabolic uh, disorders. The takeaway here is that ET is heterogeneous or diverse in character and content. It is imperative to assess the patient to, with tremor to determine the phenomenon of the tremor, the presence of or absence of other neurologic um, signs, and the effects of medications or alcohol, all of which is accumulated through a good health history and neuro, detailed neuro exam. The type of tremor and the options and the treatment can be discovered from that information. So the guidelines. Um, 
for a diagnosis for the essential tremor. Obviously, it's a bilateral action tremor of the hands and forearms, not necessarily a rest tremor. Absence of other neurologic signs, maybe isolated head tremor, long duration greater than um, three years. A family history, 35 to 50 percent of the ET cases are actually familial. Um, there may or may not be a beneficial response with alcohol. Uh, as well, you can um, oftentimes the, some of the workup might be some accelerometers, some uh, e EMGs. Um, they can be they can analyze the frequency and amplitudes of the of the tremors fairly accurately. Um, subjective exams that you will see with your neurologist that's going to be the tetras and Archimedes spiral. Um, this is when the patient actually draws a spiral without touching their hand to the to the um, tabletop or the surface, so that can exhibit the severity of the tremor. The um, rating scales require no instrumentation, and it's um, very subjective. But if you have a trained professional doing it, then they can sort of get to the get to the core of things. And then obviously physical exam and blood works to rule out other disorders. So red flags might be something like a unilateral tremor, sudden or rapid onset, um, current drug therapy that may cause or exacerbate the tremor, isolated head tremor with an abnormal posture maybe being more of a dystonia. And you can just see here the differences that were said there. And then here as well, I sort of highlighted a little bit more with regards to a lot of the stuff we've already sort of d discussed, and that is that um, that there's a, a pretty high action tremor, which I have highlighted here as far as the high amplitude of the of the Parkon Parkinsonian tremor versus the low amplitude um, and the more variable amplitude, I guess, really. But rarely a family history with uh, Parkinson's, whereas it's greater than 50%. No effect from alcohol with PD, and then obviously improves with alcohol on the ET side. Hands affected more than legs, voice, and um, head almost never affected with PD, and clearly, like I said, it is affected with that. You can classify the tremors as well. There's obviously the rest tremor, like we talked about um, with PD, which obviously more so the um, gentleman on your left, left, I guess, yeah, left. Um, and then the action tremor may be more that postural tremor, isometric tremor, kinetic tremor. Action tremors can be postural, which appear when the body is held in a particular position against gravity, so parallel arms out to the floor, out to here. Um, kinetic tremors are more goal-directed. They affect the uh, directed voluntary movements of the affected body parts, such as reaching and writing, reaching or writing, drawing, pouring a glass of water, drinking from a cup, or speaking. Um, intention tremor is a kinetic tremor that occurs with movements toward a target. So this would be where your, your tremor gets more pronounced when it's toward your nose, and if you're going out to the physician's finger, it's more pronounced, but in between, it's a little bit smoother. Isometric, or isometric tem tremors are associated with uh, sustained muscle contraction against a fixed object. So every one of us has a physiologic tremor. I probably have a little bit more of one right now, but. Um, the, uh, the tremor for, um, the physiologic tremor is more of a higher frequency tremor, 8 to 12 hertz, where with a low amplitude. The frequency of um, essential tremor varies between 6 to 12, and PD is actually much lower between 4 and 6. And obviously, it's based on the anatomical distribution, too, of the limb, the head, the trunk, jaw, that kind of a thing where you would see that. So as we all know, um, it, ET can definitely affect the quality of life, despite the fact that, you know, you it's not, they called it a benign condition, condition. Um, but um, that mean that being said, because the diagnosis doesn't shorten your life expectancy, it can definitely affect the quality of life. Um, patients may feel a worsening of symptoms over time when their tremors remain actually stable. With advancing age, uh, the tremor becomes slower and larger in amplitude, so maybe the tremor becomes more slower, but larger in amplitude and interference into activities of daily living become increasingly more difficult. The psychological impact can be disabling, and the disease itself should be, and that the disease itself and should be acknowledged um, and treated with the same commitment. So basically, what I'm trying to say, and I'm totally brutally messing up, is that the physical tremor needs to be managed as well as the emotional and the psychological impact that the tremor can have on life. Um, so living with a chronic progressive disease can not only be, can be a lonely and painful journey, and, and considering interventions and resources like psychiatry, behavioral therapy, support groups, that sort of thing, is just as important as seeing your neurologist and taking your medications. 
So I was researching a little bit with this, and coping tips are, are quite interesting, um, which I'm really glad we have OT or you know physical therapy here, occupational therapy, because learning to sort of use your tremor-free hand to stabilize the hand with the worst tremor is clearly a good thing. But I think occupational therapy and physical therapy have been found to sort of stretch and maintain general core and extremity strength, while OT is more to help relearn activities using their non-dominant arm, also focusing on strengthening upper extremities and determine the benefit of adaptive equipment so they can really kind of bring that piece in. Clearly avoiding caffeine, um, sometimes carrying a small tape recorder with you to record your notes, whether it's, you know, what do I need at the grocery store rather than having to stop and write it down. I think we all sort of take that for granted, not being able to do that. Um, using a larger handled pen, uh, larger handled uh, weighted pen, and eating, retens eating utensils. Um, signature stamp to sign your name. I thought that was kind of interesting. I almost want to do that because I feel like I sign my name a lot. Um, thick, thick reusable straws, lids, obviously. Uh, voice activated dialing or text messages. I think that's um, something that maybe could be utilized a lot more as well. Just from the standpoint, it's easier to. to I have trouble texting, so I think if you can speak your text, it seems like it might be that much faster. Hypnotherapy and Tai Chi, as well as minimizing or reducing stress. Stress. Um, the World Health Organization actually called stress a global epidemic. It's a contributing factor to high blood pressure, pretty much anything and everything, uh, how well you can fight disease. So as if there's a way to fight stress, I think that it's, the, it's clearly a good place to go. Um, so try to minimize and reduce stress. Stress management is um, through massage therapy, which I, I think that's a fantastic idea. I think we should be able to have that every day at work. Um, it's not a cure or direct treatment, but it may have therapeutic impact. Uh, there's also biofeedback. I put some, some websites on here, too, that's actually on the um, International Essential Tremor Foundation um, that talks about an awful lot about what to do to sort of to help with that. So that's all I have. That was like short of five minutes, I think. Thank <laughs> you.